the back. <laughs> okay, our next topic is what, reducing the risk of cancer is... It's probably more effective than the, reducing the risk of our bad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, though, Barbara we won't stop. No, no. Ah, go away, go away. Did y'all hear about the one-armed fisherman? Introduce the speaker. And he caught a fish that was this big. <laughs> that was good. Yeah, nice, nice clean joke. You got more? No, never mind. <laughs> oh, sound like a hospice patient. Oh. Barbara Walls, uh, she is going to be talking about uh, reducing the risk of cancer. She's worked extensively for the last 25 years in diabetes management and education. She serves as a nurse manager and director at the inpatient unit of the, at the Diabetes Center of Excellence at Humana Community Hospital for 15 years. In 1996, she assumed the responsibility as director of education at the Texas Diabetes Institute. In July of 2000, she worked under the supervision of Dr. Ralph DeFranzo at the South Texas Veteran Healthcare System, uh, ALM division, where she was the coordinator uh, of a multi-site diabetes study examining the microvascular effects of diabetes. Since 2007, she's been the Diabetes Education Program Coordinator for the South Texas Health Science Center San Antonio, providing diabetes self-management training to in and out patients and serving as a mentor and resource to other healthcare professionals in the VA system. Help us in welcoming Dr. Uh, Barbara Walls. Sorry. I'm so used to that. Yeah. Hi, guys. I, so I, I am the diabetes educator at the VA, but cancer winds into all these different things. And a couple of people, a couple of my friends, when I asked if they were coming, they go, oh, there's a mistake. They have you doing cancer. I said, yeah, I know. But one of the things I've, uh, I do is I like learning things and how, again, you put it together. Um, interestingly, I was doing some uh, resume reviews yesterday. We're looking for some new positions. People actually write on their res resumes good at collecting data or good at literature reviews. I'm thinking, oh, I never thought to put that on mine. So anyway, so I have done extensive of research, I guess, on this. Um, when they asked me to do it, I started collecting things. Do you know how much information there is out there about cancer? Lots, lots, on all kinds of resources. So I tried to put together what I thought was most practical, things that we can do something about, stuff that will affect you. And I don't think this is thing new particularly, but maybe just to remind you of things that, um, things that you can pay attention to and be aware of. The other thing I want to mention is that um, I want to redo this. This is kind of my rough draft, what I initially turned in, and then I had moved things around some, and so I picked up the wrong stick. So we're going to kind of adjust as we go. OK, some of the risk factors. Um, of course, growing older. You know, the population's getting older. Um, back in the early 1900s, the life expectancy was about 40. So a lot of people didn't get cancer because they were too young. All of y'all who were over 40, we wouldn't have been here in 1910 because that people just died off too early. And so then in the 50s, it, it increased to 65. And um, I guess a lot of y'all are aware, but that is why they picked Social Security at age 65, because they figured most people would be dead after that. I, as a young nurse back in the 80s, the late 80s, well, early 80s actually, remember very clearly talking to one of the preeminent cardiologist here in town about a patient who had diabetes. And were, he was sending him home with a blood sugar of 400. I said, you know, no, that's just not right. We can't send him home with that high of a sugar. Because even back then, the cutoff was like 150. He goes, that's OK. He's going to die soon anyway. He's 65. And I was just appalled. I even said, you know, I thought you were a pretty smart guy, and this is just disgusting. But that was the truth. Now the life, average life expectancy is in the 80s. Men at this time can expect to live to be about 79 or 80. And then Hispanic men, Mexican-American men, um, specifically, the average life expectancy is 85, the last I read. So again, as people get older, you do have an increased risk for um, cancer. Tobacco, we'll talk more about. Sunlight ionizing radiation, things that we're just exposed to you know, throughout the day in our jobs and stuff, certain chemicals, some viruses and bacteria, hormones, family history of cancer is very important. And so that's, there's things that, that can alert you that there might be something going on there. Alcohol, and then of course poor diet, lack of physical activity, are being overweight. There's a few of these things we can actually do something about. We can reduce our tobacco, 
we can reduce our alcohol intake, and then we certainly have a lot of control over our diet, exercise, and being overweight. And again, that ties into all the different risk factors, all the risk factors for all the different chronic diseases. Now, some of the risk factors, although it certainly seems that way, not everything causes cancer. If you look on the internet, you can find any, everything causes cancer. The air you breathe, the water you drink, the clothes you wear, the gas you inhale, you know, everything. But again, you just have to use some common sense about that. And again, looking at the, um, how likely it is to cause a problem. Cancer is not caused by an injury. Bruises don't cause it, bumps and stuff. We have people sometimes who come into the hospital after a car wreck, and we happen upon, while we're doing an x-ray to check their back, find out they have kidney cancer. You know, some of these things are just kind of per chance, and they swear up and down they're going to sue the people for the car wreck because it caused them to have kidney cancer. So it's very hard to convince people that that's not the way this works. But, you know, I, I almost say you're lucky you had a car wreck, and now we did some x-rays so they find out what's going on with you. It's not contagious. Although being infected with certain viruses or bacteria may increase the risk of some types of cancer and that no one can catch it, but you know, again, those kind of things can be um, transmitted to other people. Having one or more risk factors doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get cancer. I'm sure you all know the stories of the old 90-year-old man who smoked and drank his entire life, dipped, snuffed the whole bit, and they're still fine. So you know, it doesn't automatically, but it just increases your risk. And then some people are more uh, sensitive than others to those known risk factors, of course. Now, the number one thing is growing older. That's one of the most important risk factors. Most cancers occur in people over the age of 65, not to say that children don't also get cancer. We see that a lot too, but again, the older you get, the more things you've been exposed to, the more your cells get tired and worn out. And so there's just a greater risk then for developing, um, being more sensitive to the different external environmental factors. Chemical exposure. Um, people who have certain jobs, painters, construction workers, um, people who are in the chemical industry, of course, have more exposure. Um, studies have shown that exposure to asbestos, benzene, benzidine, cadmium, nickel, or vinyl chloride can cause cancer. We've got, with OSHA now, we've got all kinds of protective gear people have to wear. Um, I grew up in a house that had asbestos siding. Have not had any problems yet. I'm hoping that doesn't happen. But you know, back in the 50s and 60s, a lot of the houses, all that siding was all made out of asbestos. And so it's out there all over the place. Uh, the same thing with lead. You know, it's a big deal now not to have lead paint on the baby cribs. I don't know about you, but I chewed on lead paint all the time. You know, there's a lot of things. So again, it's, it's been associated, but it's not a, a direct uh, for sure type of thing. So just be aware that some of the different chemical exposures. Um, I had a friend tell me recently, you know, there's a big deal about Agent Orange. And so I have a friend who has an old uncle that lives out in the Selma area. So he went over and said, I've got this problem with these weeds in my backyard. He goes, well, come here, I got this thing I got, a 55-gallon drum of what he called DDT. He had got it back in the 60s sometime, and it works really good at getting rid of all those things. And so he's going, you know, Uncle Herman, this is like not good. He goes, I know, don't tell anybody because they'll take it away. So it's still out there, you know. But again, it's just... You have to weigh the, the risks and stuff. You want to make sure you follow instructions and the safety tips that are um, put out there to avoid or reduce that contact with the hazardous chemicals, both at work and at home. All the, you know, all the different chemicals we use is for cleaning house and stuff, a lot of times if there's too much exposure. I've read articles that said that they find high levels of aluminum sometime in breast cancer nodes. All, the, all of the, well most, most of the, um, uh, antiperspirants have aluminum in it. So does that mean we don't use deodorant anymore? So again, just be aware that they're, you know, just be careful with that. Although the risk is highest for those workers, with years of exposure, it should make good sense to be used um, caution at all times, wearing gloves, make sure you wash your hands, don't rub it in your eyes, spray on your face. Um, my husband was telling me about, you know, pain exposure. When he was in high school, they had a parade, and they had, it was Wizard of Oz. He was the tin man, so they sprayed him with, with silver paint. He said it didn't dawn on him, but it wasn't going to come off for about two weeks. And so I said, well, that explains a lot why he acts the way he does. <laughs> viruses and bacteria. Being infected with certain viruses or bacteria certainly increase your risk of developing cancer. One is the human papilloma virus. The um, HPV infection is a main cause of cervical cancer and may also contribute to other sorts of cancers. Hepatitis B and hepatitis C certainly do. The liver can develop, uh, you can develop liver cancer after many years of infection. The human T cell leukemia and lymphoma virus. Um, the HIV virus, um, we don't hear a lot about that anymore. You know, we had such a big 
um, discussion about HIV and AIDS back in probably the 70s, 80s, things like that. And it's kind of calmed down now. Not that it's gone away, but you know, I think they've developed the medications now that make it much more manageable. And they just had an interview with Magic Johnson the other day on the TV, and he looks great. He says he feels great. And so, you know, as things move along, we're developing more and more ways of treating it, more and more understanding of things. So um, one of the big problems, though, with HIV is the lymphomas and that cancer, the uh, Kaposi sarcomas. Epstein-Barr is another one, another virus, increased risk, risk, risk of lymphoma. The human herpes virus 8, that's another risk factor for that Kaposi sarcoma. Helicobacter pylori, now this is something that's come about just not too long ago. You know, we used to think about the whole thing with ulcers. Now that we understand that it comes from a virus, we can treat that and uh, help with preventing the um, ulcers of people. And it can also cause stomach cancer and lymphomas, again, if it's not being treated properly or in um, a timely fashion. Um, some of the protective things is do not have unprotected sex or share needles. Still see that a lot. I'm amazed how many people are still out there be, again, I'm in the diabetes field, which means, as you all know, diabetes affects impotent. It, one of the side effects is impotence. And so with the whole, the new erectile dysfunction drugs, um, we have to discuss all those kind of things with the patients, not just taking their insulin, but a lot of other things. I've had to quit telling my husband what I discussed that day, because he, he says, I thought you did diabetes. I said, I know, but all these other things figure in, you know? And now that we have, uh, you know, the Viagra and the... Um, Oh, see, Alice, because that opens up a whole new market of things. And so a lot of times the gentlemen in their 60s aren't aware of the, because these problems weren't out there when they were kids. You know, if they've been in a long-term relationship, their wife dies, they get divorced, whatever happens. Um, you know, I, this isn't about getting people pregnant anymore. You've got bigger problems with it. So just, you know, making sure that they're aware of that and that they are um, using safe sex and using protective sex. Um, it's interesting when you go to senior citizen centers, a lot of them have discussions on AIDS and hepatitis and stuff and using, you know, being, um, with, if they are sexually active, using, um, being protected. Um, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, again, sharing needles. Different hormones can um, cause cancer or can um, increase your risk of cancer. Um, sometimes doctors recommend estrogen or estrogen with progesterone to help control problems such as hot flashes or vaginal dryness, thinning bones, that occur during menopause. There's been a lot of discussions showing that some of those hormones can cause serious side effects. The hormones can increase the risk of breast cancer, of heart attacks, strokes, or blood clots. There's a lot of controversy back and forth about that. Um, depending on which literature is out at that time, it's always interesting when I go see my gynecologist, what he's sharing from the latest, but things kind of, to me, they're kind of bouncing back and forth right now. But so it's up, it's up to the person, up to you know, whatever their family risk is, what other exposures they have, what their physician thinks, how bad the hot flashes are. I've got friends who said, I don't care what's going to happen. I cannot live this way now. I'm taking something so I can sleep at night and not have all the hot flash problems. Um, again, they, uh, a woman who's considering hormonal therapy needs to discuss those risks and benefits with the doctor. DES was a big uh, um, estrogen giving back in the 40s and um, early 70s and stuff. And they found out that women who took that DES during pregnancy had a higher risk of developing breast cancer. Also, the female offspring of those women are having problems now with types of uh, cervical cancer. And so we're seeing those women now in their 40s and 50s and stuff. Also, um, they don't know quite for sure what effect it might have on the male offspring, but they're still studying that. There's also certain birth defects that were um, associated with that. I know there's a young lady at our church that was born without any fingers on one hand, and they says because her mother took the DES during her, for a, um, she was having a stressful pregnancy. Women who took DES or their daughters need to go in, again, just be screened on a regular basis and get checkups and stuff to make sure everything's okay. If you have a positive family history, Again, cancers develop because of mutated genes. Normal cells can become cancerous after if there's a series of mutations that occur. They're not, you know, sometimes those mutations are naturally occurring, sometimes it's because of different exposures. There's all kinds of things. Interestingly, if you stop and think back, people's genetics hasn't, haven't changed that much. 
If you um, go back 100 years, again, people are living longer because of we're, we've got so much you know, better medications, better screening, better ways of dealing with things, earlier detection, but the actual genetics haven't changed. So it, you can't say that there's, it's, it's in the genes to a certain point, but it's not all genetic. So that tobacco use, viruses, all those things we've already talked about can cause some changes in the different cells. Some gene changes increase the risk of cancer are passed on from fam family to, uh, between the families. Some of those changes are present at birth in all cells of the body. It's uncommon for cancer to run in families, but you've all heard the stories. There was a, a special in like um, oh, Parade magazine or whatever about a year ago about a family that had a very strong history of stomach cancer and the mother had died, the grandma had died, Aunt Tilly died, Uncle Herman died. So I think there was like 11 kids. They all decided to have their stomachs removed um, and so to, to prevent them from getting stomach cancer. The same thing with, um, what's her name, Angelina Jolie had a mastectomy done. So some people, some, some people consider that very radical. Some people, friends of mine who have a strong family history said, I cannot stand the thought of every year thinking, is this gonna be the year? Are we gonna catch it soon enough? And so they've also undergone preventative or prophylactic type um, mastectomies. Um, melanomas, cancer of the breast, ovary, prostate, colon, sometimes run in families. Um, there was a young lady at the VA, if y'all remember, the dietitian who had um, colon cancer, and she got screened at, at 30, which is kind of early for most, but just because she has such a strong family history, and they found colon cancer. And so she had it corrected, and she's uh, doing well, and expects to be, expects to be cancer-free for a long time, but again, she's going every six months for her checkups. Um, let's see, if you think you have a pattern of a certain type of cancer in your family, talk to your doctor, make sure everybody knows about it. You might want to get earlier screenings. Uh, a lot of that sometimes depends on insurance, and a lot of that is driven by what the insurance companies determine to be appropriate. And so um, we're going to, I think with the new health care, we're going to have to kind of work some of that out as to what is, um, if you have a family history and you're looking for something specific. And so you might want to talk to your doctor also about ways to reduce your risk of developing cancer or different exams that can detect it early enough. Ask your doctor about genetic testing. There's some, like the BRAC gene, again, that puts you at increased risk. So just be aware of what's in your family history. Talk to people. I'm amazed how many people, again, we do some of that. Like you have a family history of diabetes, and they go, I have no clue. I said, never asked your mother if anybody had diabetes. No. Well, somebody needs to talk to somebody. You know, just find out what your family history is because it has a lot to do then with what goes on in the future. And does it, if you do have a family history, that doesn't mean you're going to get it. Again, it just means that you have an increased risk and you might be a little more conscientious about screenings. Alcohol also increases. Having more than two drinks a day for many years may increase the risk of the chance of developing cancer of the mouth, uh, throat, esophagus, liver, larynx, breast. They increase this with the amount of alcohol they drink. For most of those cancers, the risk is higher if they also smoke with it. So again, how many people have a beer and a couple of uh, cigarettes at the time? Or a lot of people, when you ask, do you smoke, they go, only when I'm drinking. Well, like, how often is that? Oh, a couple times a day. So, so that definitely increases the, the chances. Um, Doctors will advise people who drink to do so in moderation. I found that is a different concept for a lot of people. If you ask one person what moderate is, it's totally different than another person. You know, some people think a six pack is, that's moderate, because they used to drink a 12 pack. Uh, but you know, so just one or two, they usually recommend one or two a day. Um, oh, that's the same thing. Never mind, somehow that got repeated. Obesity and sedentary lifestyle. This is popping up in everything. This increases your risk for, for many chronic diseases. So again, being aware of people that have a poor diet, don't have enough physical activity, or overweight, are at increased risk for certain types of cancers. Studies suggest that people whose diet is high in fat have an increased risk of cancer of the colon, uterus, and prostate. Lack of physical activity and being overweight are risk factors for cancer of the breast, colon, esophagus, kidney, and uterus. Also, there's a lot of discussion about with, with um, the dietary thing too, you know, more processed meats increase your risk of cancer, more of the carcinogen type things, you know, like smoked meats or the, the meat that's been exposed to high heat like barbecue and fajitas, things like that tend to increase the risk of stomach cancer. So just kind of be aware of that. You have to use it, again, in moderation. Poor eating habits, having a healthy diet, being physically active, again, um, Doctors, dietitians, nurses, everybody suggests having a healthy diet, plenty of foods, high in fiber, vitamins, minerals, whole grain breads and cereals, 
five to nine servings of fruits and vegetables. I would like to comment, this is the diabetes side of me talking now, that fruits are full of sugar. Fruits will make you fat. If you ever Google that, there was a study done by the National Institutes of Health that if you take these, okay, a serving of carbohydrate is 15 grams of carbs. A piece of bread versus an apple or an orange versus a glass of milk. The orange puts on more belly fat. So fruit, when, they're, when they talk about more fruits and vegetables, I would prefer they say more vegetables and a few fruits thrown in. If you stop and talk to your grandparents, your grandparents you get, didn't get a whole lot of fruit. My mother, who's 90, said they got fruit a couple of times a year because they, where they lived out in South Texas, they didn't have any fruit. You grew watermelons during the summer. You had cantaloupes. If you were lucky, you might have a peach tree or something. But during the wintertime and stuff, they didn't have a whole lot. And so when they started that old saying, an apple a day, that was to encourage our, our parents and grandparents to have a piece of fruit. The fruit company has done an excellent job of convincing us all, the more fruit you eat, the better. And that's not necessarily true, so be very careful. Four ounces of juice is a normal juice glass. My mother passed away recently, so I was going through her cabinets. I found those old little Bugs Bunny juice glasses that we used to drink out of. Nobody wants them. <laughs> what are they going to do with that? Because no one, everybody drinks great like Bill Miller mugs full of orange juice. That definitely will raise your blood sugar, and that extra sugar is going to have to go somewhere. It goes into your gut. And the gut fat is what causes more diabetes, certain cancers, heart disease, all that kind of stuff. So just be careful. I just, just be careful that kind of thing. More is not better. Um, limit foods with high fat, butters, whole milk, fried foods. I don't want to mention all the hamburger companies coming into town. They're just totally full of fat. But just be, be careful. If you're going to do fast food and stuff, try to make it a healthier choice. Maybe um, lay off the mayonnaise. Mayonnaise is full of fat. And just look at the different options you have. You know, instead of having mayonnaise, have mustard. Instead of having um, white bread, have whole wheat bread. Now, a lot of patients say, well, isn't whole wheat good for you? Well, it's better than white. Well, yeah, that's why I eat a lot of it. That's not the way this works. And so you still have to use some limitations and be aware of those, the calories in, okay? Be active and maintain a healthy lifestyle. We have all gotten to the point, people just aren't very active anymore. Um, for those of you who are, aren't aware of it, I just want to mention, being from the VA, we now have a bariatric um, and a weight management clinic. We're doing bariatric surgery on the kids coming back from Iraq. We've got kids 26, 28 years old who are already 350 pounds, and they're fresh out of the military. And so when I was asking them about it, I said, so like, how does this happen if you're in the military? Well, apparently when you're over there, there's not a lot of opportunities for activity. They can't go outside the wire because they're at risk for getting shot. Or, you know, they don't have, not all the forward, the FOBs, forward operating bases are big compounds. They're just little. And they have nothing to do if they're all doing computer stuff to support everybody else. They're, they have lots and lots of food. In fact, they were talking, I was reading in the paper about some of the um, different you know, this is the old mother thing. I, your mother can't offer you much but good meals. So I think the military has kind of ha taken that attitude to, too, that they'll have plenty of good food there and they send these four-star chefs out and stuff. These kids, just they're just eating way too much. And so, again, keeping active, watching the amount of food intake and stuff, reducing body fat. It's a good idea. Most all studies have shown you need at least 150 minutes a, day, a, a week of activity. That's about 30 minutes five times a week. Now, that doesn't have to be 30 minutes all at the same time. Some people can't tolerate 30 minutes of walking at a time. Some people don't have time for 30 minutes at a time. But three 10-minute periods. If you could just find little extra five and 10-minute things. The uh, recommendation is about 10,000 steps a day. That's quite a few steps. I went over to my sister's house the other day, and she was saying the table one plate at a time. And I said, what exactly are you doing? She goes, I'm getting my 10,000 steps in. So she took one fork at a time to the table. So anyway, so there's little things like that that you can do to increase your activity. She's also like 108 pounds. Okay, screening. Now, again, this is probably the most important thing you can do is screen, again, to pick these things up early enough. Sometimes the cancers can be caught before they ever cause symptoms. Many of them, once you have symptoms, it's too late and there's not a lot you can do. So um, again, that's screening. Uh, they help doctors find and treat cancer. Uh, it's more effective when it's found early, and they do a lot of screening for breast, cervical, um, colon, rectal cancer, oral cancer. I know the dentist is always looking for oral cancers for those people who go to the dentist. There's a lot of people who don't have dental insurance, and it's gotten awfully expensive. Breast cancer, mammograms your best choice. Um, I was reading the other day, they have a new 3D one, 
where uh, there's a lady right in front of the hospital uh, has a little free clinic, uh, not free clinic, a free standing clinic, which they said that will pick up things much, um, um, give a much better visualization. And so again, their x-rays, women in their 40s and older need to have at least every year or two. If you're high risk for breast cancer, you should talk to your doctor about getting the, um, your mammograms before that time, before 40. Cervical cancer, pap test, so again, it's the kind of the gold standard, check for a cancer cells, scraping a little sampling and sending it to the lab, checking for any changes that may lead to cancer. Um, many changes are caused by the human papilloma, papilloma virus, and it's one of the important risk factors. Women should begin having pap tests about three years after they become sexually active or if they reach age 21, whichever comes first. Um, most women need to have a, their pap every three years. Once they hit 50, they're usually recommending every year or so. Colon and rectum, again, we try to get colonoscopies on everybody. It's pretty painless. Well, pain, they knock you out, so it's probably painless at this point. The hardest part is all that cleansing stuff you do beforehand. Um, just get a good book and spend the afternoon getting things clean. Uh, people age 50 and older should be screened. People who have higher than average risk of cancer of the colon and rectum should probably talk to their doctor about having it done earlier. Again, the dietitian at the VA, thank goodness she got it screened at 30 and found out she was already had some cancerous polyps and so she had that corrected. Some other things they do for colon cancer is, called, of course, the fecal occult blood test. A lot of times those cancer cells will cause some blood to be excreted, and so they can detect blood in the stool. Your sigmoidoscopy, where they just look inside the rectum and the lower part of the colon. Uh, the colonoscopy, where they actually go up higher using the live tote. If anybody's had this, they know exactly what they're talking about. Um, they can remove polyps through those tubes. Um, another quick story. Um, I have lots of stories. This guy at our church, who's who's very active in the church, he's an usher and stuff. He was where he usually wears boots and jeans. He was there with sweatpants on, which I thought was un unusual. So I said, "So what's going on? You're having sweatpants on?" He goes, "Oh, I just had colon surgery." I said, "Really? When?" He goes, "Yesterday." I said, "For real?" He goes, "Yeah." That apparently he donates blood all the time. So he went to give uh, give his blood, and they said he was anemic, which they says very unusual because he's one of those guys that gives like every six or eight weeks, whatever you can do. And so they said, "You better get this checked." Well, so he calls his cousin who's a doctor down in Victoria, he goes, yeah, you better get that checked. That's not a good sign to you are a young, healthy, 42-year-old man to be anemic. So he gave him a referral to a, um, some friend of his that does colonoscopies, got him in that next week. And so within a matter of 10 days, he, got he, he, he was screened, diagnosed, had the surgery in his back at church. And so, again, so, so there's, uh, there's little fortuitous things like that that luckily people kind of stumble upon. But, you know, take advantage of some of those kind of things just as a general health screening. So double contrast barium enemas, um, that's where they put the barium in. They pump, it, pump the uh, um, air into the colon so they can see if there's any problems there. And then the famous digital rectal exam. The old guys at the VA call it the finger wave. Also, so trying to find out if they have any, you know, abnormalities, if there's any, um, if the prostate's enlarged, things like that. Uh, also, another thing they do a lot is a PSA test. Uh, PSAs can tell if they're enlarged, I mean, if there's a problem with the pr prostate, and then they might uh, suggest they do an ultrasound or something like that, too, just to follow up on that. Window screen. Usually you have to weigh the factors related to the test. So, you know, is the test, is it worthwhile for the, um, just again, weighing your risk and benefits of things. Um, pay attention to the person's risk for certain types of cancers. Uh, the doctor will take into consideration your age, your family history, your exposure, your lifestyle. Have they been exposed to a lot of chemicals? Have they been having any kind of problems? Um, they look at the risk of the follow-up tests or the surgeries. Um, there was an article I was reading about, there's a lot of question right now about doing breast biopsies. Uh, you know, if they find a nodule, do they want to do the biopsy? Because as they put the needle in and they capture those cancer cells, they also extract them and track them out. And so there's some discussion about whether or not they should do that type of thing. And so, um, so there's a lot of, um, I'll just... I don't think there's any hard, fast rules. It, it kind of depends on your physician, what you're comfortable with, and what, again, your risk factors are. Um, they need to find, think about the risk and benefits of treating. So, you know, some of the cancer therapies are pretty rigorous. And so if you have somebody who's 87 years old and they have a colon cancer or a prostate, that's another one. Right now, prostate cancer, they don't suggest surgery right away on all of them because they say a lot of them are very slow growing. You know, after prostate surgery, a lot of the men have problems with urinary incontinence, incontinence impotence, all that kind of thing. So again, we have to weigh the factors. Is it a 35-year otherwise very healthy man or is it somebody who's 87 who might 
be lucky if they have another 10 or 12 years of life expectancy. Uh, talk with the doctor about side effects and the benefits of being checked for cancer. Um, decision to be screened is a personal one, and everyone needs to decide that based on, again, the pros and cons of what they, they're hoping to accomplish. Oh, get that. Okay, things that you can do to help prevent this. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention is that another form of cancer that's being more, that we're seeing more and more is liver cancer from NASH, non-alcoholic steatic hepatitis. There's about 20 to 40 percent of people in the United States have fatty liver disease. This is a little dietary thing. When you eat carbohydrates, half the carbohydrates go directly into your bloodstream to use for fuel. So whenever at lunch today you had rice, you had beans, you had tortilla, you had dessert. So your body's going to use part of that right off the bat. The rest of it gets tucked away in your liver for like overdraft protection. Your body knows that you don't need all that fuel at this time because carbohydrates are the fuel for your body. If you don't need that extra fuel, you tuck it away. So that during the times that you don't eat, your liver is constantly squirting out little bits of sugar. So your liver is responsible for keeping your blood sugar up. Because again, carbohydrates is your fuel. It's the gasoline for your car. This goes back to the early days when our grandparents didn't get a lot of food. Back during the Depression and stuff, a couple of gentlemen had told me when they were growing up, there was three kinds of meals at their house, oatmeal, cornmeal, and no meal, because people just didn't have a lot of money. So that when our ancestors were exposed to that, either at that point or even further before that, when we were all nomadic and hunter-gatherer types, people would eat a lot during times of feast, and they would store that extra in their liver, so that during times of famine, they would pull that extra fuel from their liver. So that those of you who, um, there's some people who have this idea that if they go to bed without a snack, they're going to starve. Ain't going to happen. You're going to be okay. Most people have plenty of fuel there. In fact, the military knows you've got about 14 days worth of stored fuel in your liver. That's why the, for the first 14 days, it's a rescue mission. After that, it's a recovery mission. If anyone's ever been in the Marine Corps, that's one of the things they do. They send them out in the field for, th for a week with three meals just to let them know you're not going to die. You won't starve. But anyway, so because they keep... Putting, you know, putting that, uh, storing the liver, store the liver, store the liver, eventually that extra, the stored stuff in your liver gets hard, it gets stiff, and you, it gets cirrhotic. So we're seeing fatty liver disease then leads to cirrhosis, some hepatitis, and more liver cancer. So we're actually having an increase in liver cancer in people who have fatty liver disease. Okay. Things that you can do. Not use tobacco. Again, as we mentioned, tobacco puts you at increased risk. It's been linked, linked, linked to various types of cancer, um, particularly bladder cancer. There's been a couple of medications over in Europe that didn't work because people end up um, having bladder cancer from it. But, but, may, not for that, but because of the fact they smoke. So you always have to tease that out when you're looking at studies and stuff. Chewing tobacco has a lot of increased risk of oral cavity and uh, even the pancreas cancer, which is interesting. Even if you don't use tobacco, again, secondhand smoke has been implicated in some problems. So again, just be aware of that. Avoiding tobacco or stop using it is an important health decision you can make. There's lots and lots of opportunities and lots of help out there to, um, to help people with smoking cessation. Um, a lot of people have been smoking for 40, 50, 60, 70 years. And so um, we do have different patches. There are pills. There are smoking cessation classes. And so if any of y'all still smoke, please look for help. The other thing I would like to um, encourage is if you're a healthcare professional, every time you talk to someone, encourage them to continue. You know, ask them every time if they're ready to stop. Because someone who might not be ready to stop today from smoking in a month might change their mind when their best friend finds out they have throat cancer or their, their um, brother dies from lung cancer or something like that. So there's always different motivation things that come up or different impetuses that, that motivate people to finally want to stop. Eat a more healthy diet. Again, you want to make healthier decisions at the grocery store because that's where it all starts because once it gets home, you're going to eat it. So when you're shopping, make sure that you're making healthier decisions there. Take advantage of some of the um, farmer's markets around town if you haven't uh, been there. Pearl Brewery has a really nice farmer's market if you haven't been out there. Uh, go down 281, heading toward downtown, get off on Grayson Street, it'll take you right into the parking lot. If you don't know, a lot of people were not raised on vegetables because a lot of this is a learned thing. If your mother didn't like Brussels sprouts, you probably didn't learn to eat Brussels sprouts as a kid. And so these farmers will take, tell you about different ways to cook it and stuff. And so um, they're very willing and, uh, to help out with that kind of thing. So get some fresh vegetables and stuff. There's also a lot of discussion about the different chemicals and stuff they, they put on the um, plants or the vegetables as they ship them in. And so these are fresh. The people come from Pearsall, from, from Castroville, from Atascosa, Wilson County, and they have them all there. There's also a new farmer's market out at 
Allian, I think it's that big fancy thing across from the rim. They have a really nice farmer's market too, but look in your neighborhood, you know, support your local people, your local farmers and stuff, and get some fresh vegetables, because they taste a whole lot better than what, you know, after they've been shipped in from someplace else. Limit your fat, choose lower fat meats, be careful with things like bologna, sausages, hot dogs. Uh, those are all very high fat. When you look on the back of most bologna and sausages, hot dogs, most of them are about 90% fat. When you're looking at hot dogs and sausages, they, the, the packing company or the produ um, what they call them, butcher company, butcher place, will take that animal and lay it down and cut out all the good parts. The rest of it goes into the leftovers that they can't sell, goes into a waste receptacle. At the end of the day, they dump it in the grinder. It's fine grind for hot dog and bologna, coarse grind for sausages. And even though it says all beef sausage, most of those all beef is beef fat, beef liver, beef lungs, beef kidney, all the stuff they're not going to sell in some other fashion. So when you're looking at your sausages, hot dogs, bologna, make sure you kind of get the kind that says all meat. Because it can be 100% turkey. My cousin lives in Nixon, Texas. They are one of the largest producers of poultry products, chicken and turkey. They use the skin. They use the little gristle on the end of the bones that's all ground up and put into your chicken hot dogs. So just because it says chicken or turkey doesn't mean it's low fat. So again, look on the label and make sure it says all meat. And you can buy low fat hot dogs and they're the, the same price. Low fat hot dog or fat free hot dogs are about $1.50 a pound. They're 16 ounces and that's about the cheapest meat you're gonna buy, all meat. So again, if, you're, if you like that kind of stuff, just, just be, make better choices, okay? Um, high fat diets, of course, are higher in fat and increase the re risk of being overweight, which increases your risk then for cancer, diabetes, heart disease, the whole works. If you drink alcohol, do so in moderation. The, again, cancer of the breast, colon, lung, kidney, liver, increases the amount of alcohol you drink and the duration of time that you've been drinking. Maintain a healthy weight, try to get enough exercise in, look for opportunities to be more active as opposed to being less active. Uh, when you're at the um, doctor's office waiting, you can walk around a few times. At the airport, you're gonna be on a plane for two or three hours anyway. Take a walk around the airport and look at all the other things going on. Um, park your car a little further. Don't drive to the mailbox. Walk out to the mailbox to get your mail. While you've got your kids or your grandkids at soccer practice, take a little walk around the block and stuff. So again, we're not, we, do, we don't have to do it for a living as our ancestors did. We have to do it to live. Uh, any kind of physical activity helps. Um, again, that um, 150 uh, hours, 150 minutes a week or 75 minutes a week of uh, uh, vigorous act exercise also helps. Okay? Protect yourself from the sun. This is a big issue right now because with everyone using sunscreen and stuff, you know, I'm sure you're aware that vitamin D levels are very low across the United States. And they're really looking at that as to, you know, we're not exposed to the sun as much as our, uh, as our relatives. Um, when I was a little girl, I used to stay at my grandmother's house because she lived in town. And we would walk about a mile and a half to go buy bread and milk and eggs. And we'd get a little popsicle and we'd walk back. Well, that whole time we're pretty much exposed to the sun. But, um, so we had more vitamin D, but uh, it's, it's the way people are exposed now that's really increased the risk of cancer and stuff. So avoid the midday sun, especially here in South Texas. But actually, that should be a little different. 10 o'clock in the morning here is still pretty good. Our highest sun exposure is probably between 2 and 5, because that's actually the hottest part of the day. And so if you're working outside, that's why you'll see the construction workers or the guys pouring concrete and stuff, they start like at 2 or 3 in the morning. So they're back in by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Stay in the shade if you can. Uh, make sure you wear sunglasses. Again, that's a relatively new thing. We didn't have, wear sunglasses when I was a kid, and we were outside all day long, you know? And so um, for the macular um, degeneration, broad brim hats help. Cover your exposed areas. You can go to a, at a Bass Pro Shop or Gander Mountain or Academy. They have um, um, the PF, PFC, protection factor. Well, you know, the thing that protects you from the skin, already in the shirts. And so I know you can get like 35, S, what's it called? Yeah. SPF, that's it. Sun protection factor, yeah. So you can buy hats, you can buy clothes with that already in there. So if you're going to be out in the sun a lot, you know, wear the, the longer sleeve with that. They're lightly woven, but they do have that SPF in it. Um, dark colors, which reflect more of the um, ultraviolet radiation. Don't grip on the sunscreen, and you know you do have to re reapply it periodically. So make sure you reapply, especially nose, ears, the places that get exposed more often. And then be very careful with the tanning beds and sun lamps. So that's very popular among the young kids nowadays. Um, I have boys, so I never worry about this, but my friends tell me that like before prom and stuff, you have to start like three months before to get your tan down right, and they all go to the tanning beds. 
um, get your immunization, make sure that you uh, are protected against certain viral infections, that you have your hepatitis B and um, um, oh, immunizations, your human papillomavirus um, injections, avoid risky beh behaviors, again, making sure that you're practicing safe sex, um, <laughs> make sure they're using a condom, or again, just talk, the more sexual partners you have, um, the more likely you are to have a sexually transmitted infection. Something I need to remind my patients when they tell me, well, we're monogatous, or I'm monogatous, so what about her? Is she too? Well, I'm not real sure. Not you, but you know, whoever they're. <laughs> but, but it's always interesting talking to these older guys, who are, and, and I, but they're very kind of naive about this kind of stuff. And so, and they're coming to get their Viagra, and the, the, the number, and those of you who work at the Bay probably know this, the number one drug that gets refilled without a doc, their Viagra and Cialis, Levitra, they always refill that. They don't refill their insulin, they don't refill their heart, they don't refill their Lasix, but boy, that other stuff is right up the top. But again, just being aware, uh, not sharing needles. In fact, there was just an article the other day about a gentleman here in San Antonio who gives out needles, gives out clean needles, so that everyone, um, to decrease the risk of some of these um, um, hepatitis and stuff. Get regular medical care. Make sure you go to the physician. Get your screenings. You know, I think it, we we as uh, as individuals and consumers have to be a little more assertive nowadays. The average doctor spends about seven to eight minutes with the patient. I've actually heard surgery uh, stories from some people who talk about that the doctor actually sets a little timer, and that when it goes off, you get ten minutes. When it's off, that's done. And they will say, "What's your biggest problem today? We'll deal with that. If we have time, we'll get around to the other things. Well, if you have an ear infection, that's going to get taken care of, and then you have to make another appointment for the next thing." And so um, I try to encourage patients to be very, uh, very organized, very uh, write things down so they don't forget anything. Um, I don't mean to be rude, but when the doctor goes, "Hey, how's it going? How are the kids?" That doesn't matter. I got things here I need to talk about. <laughs> Let's get all these things done. And so you know, just being more and encourage the patients too to be that way, to be prepared, to get this, to be ready to discuss things and ask the questions they need. Um, there's a local endocrinologist here in town who has a very big practice. They, the doctor never sits down when they come into the office. They have rooms back to back and they have a computer that twists. So the doctor walks in, does whatever he needs to do, types on the computer, gets all your stuff together, okay, and in seven minutes they're out and they go to the next room. So I, I feel really sorry for those guys because they never get to sit down. And so it's a, a very much more fast-paced um, kind of thing. So you can't really get down to all the, by the way, I've been meaning to talk to you. My daddy had you know, colon cancer. What do you think about me getting you know, checked or something like that? So again, just be aware and making sure that you get screened early and at the appropriate times. Now this was interesting. I, I was listening to, um, if you want more information, I'll tell you this right now. If you want more information, you can go to the American Cancer Society, Google cancer, you will get all kinds of stuff. Um, you can go look in any red book, ladies home journal, all that kind of stuff, or NPR. On Sunday mornings, they have all these people that they interview. And we were going somewhere and this guy was talking about cancer fighting food. So I thought it was interesting, so I'm furiously taking notes. But again, breast cancer sometimes they think is related to the kind of foods you eat. So these foods that um, are things that they have found that helps with not just breast cancer, but you know, colon cancer, different things like that. So I want to share these with you. Cabbage is one. It's in high in plant chemicals known as gluc glucosinolates. Gluc glucosinolates. Uh, it's, it's a phytochemical, and they help your body detoxify the cancer-causing substances, keeping estrogen levels in balance, and stop cancer cells from growing. Cabbage adds texture to your meal. You can use it cooked, you can use it raw, you can put it on your tacos, you can put it mixed in salads, all that kind of stuff. So that's something that's very easy, it's cheap. Um, that's one of the, the most reasonable ones. So if you, if you don't like cooked cabbage, you can try it raw. But again, that's something you might want to think about doing. I've got a couple of friends who have had breast cancer and they said they eat cabbage every single day. In some form or fashion, they work it in. Carrots, they have high levels of a powerful plant chemical called carotinoids. Kerot carotidontoids, whatever, that word right there. Um, help prevent breast cancer by stopping the growth of cancer cells and improving your immune system. Again, shred it. My, my sister shreds carrots and puts it in meatloaf and meatballs, everything, because her kids don't like them. So she puts it in all kinds of stuff, but they never know it. And so you can make, I guess, carrot cake or muffins would be okay too, as long as you don't eat too many of it. But again, you, this is something you could slide into some foods without a lot of uh, change uh, to the actual food. Spinach, it's high in folate. That's a vitamin used in creation and repair of your DNA. 
damage to DNA is a reason many of people develop cancer. Again, this is another thing you can slide in. You can throw it in with your spaghetti sauce. You can chop it up real fine and throw it into salads. You can throw it into um, omelets. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can encourage. And for the others who don't know, spinach grows really well here. You can grow your own spinach, get yourself a pot, and within three days, it'll, it'll start growing. And you can and just pluck a couple of leaves off every day as long as you leave little roots, it'll keep growing. So this is something you can just go out in the garden and get it off in your backyard. Um, this talks about adding it to your morning smoothie, whatever. Sardines, it's very high in omega-3 fats, low in environmental contaminants. Omega-3 fats help to lower breast cancer risk by reducing unnecessary inflammation in your body, as well as all over. So it's not just breast cancer, but also colon cancer, a lot of the other things too. So that's another thing you can look at. Black beans, an excellent source of fiber. We had black beans today in that little salad that we had, which counteracted the carcinogens from the grilled meat. So, but it's, again, it's very helpful in cancer prevention. Um, fiber helps, get your, helps your body get rid of the unnecessary estrogens. Um, Anyway, so just look around in your cabinet and stuff, and you'll see that, you know, some of these foods, and again, if you go, there's all kinds of stuff. There's things that claim, but again, you know, be careful with the things that you see on the internet, because again, I tell, patients come in all the time saying they saw this on the internet. I said, we could write an article for the internet if you want to. So, you know, just be aware and, and, and try to go for reputable sources, run it by your dietitian, run it by the physician, so that they know. Please keep in mind, though, that not all physicians are real well versed in dietary things either. I've had a lot of discussions with some of my physicians, because that was, they had no dietary training. And so they pick up on the same things that with patients kind of like run with it and you have to stop and tell them to think this through. And that's all that I found that I wanted to share with you. Um, if anybody has any comments or things that they found, hopefully this will give you some things just to kind of think about and um, either in your own life or again in, in counseling patients and stuff to um, help them to recognize that, you know, what risk they might be at and how to prevent some of those risks from occurring. Any questions, comments? Yes, sir. Right, when you've had cancer? So what? Every five years is what I've heard. That's usually, yeah. Oh, it's five years, uh, you know. Uh, I said, well, yeah, but uh, what's the protocol? Well, it's an x-ray. I said, well, is it? So they went back and they found out it's a CT scan once a year after five years. Hmm. But then every time I go, they say, well, you know, it's this many years. I said, you know, I'm going to come back to you every year. You know, That's how they caught it. It's It's... I think people have to be more and more advocates for themselves. Kind of in the old days, yeah. you could allow the doctor to make the decision. They are too busy to worry about all that stuff. You really need to keep track of your own your own health, your own timing, your, your all those kind of things, and um, keep up on things to you know to to address that with your doctor about you know it's been five years, it's been whatever however long it's been. I do have a family history. This this and this is happening. Can we maybe get it moved up? And unfortunately, like I said, a lot of it has to do with insurance because the insurance has some pretty um, they, they're the ones that set the criteria because they're the ones paying for it. So we just need to uh, continue to advocate for those kind of things and again, be your own best friend. Mm -hmm.